name is Matt Bennett. I'm the founder and president of Christian Union. Christian Union is a, a regional Christian leadership development organization, and we support and resource uh, Princeton Faith in Action and Legacy student organizations and alumni organizations of Princeton University. Uh, Christian Union and uh, PFA were founded back in 2002, so this is our 10 year anniversary for which we praise God. And I want to share a couple of things about um, Christian Union and Christian Faith in Action and then explain what we're doing this morning. Uh, Christian Union, we began in order to uh, develop uh, Christian leaders at a number of the nation's most academically intensive and influential universities so that as they graduate and go out in the world, they will be making an impact for Jesus Christ. Uh, there's uh, no one more amazing, more wonderful uh, to be imitated, to praise, and adored than our Lord Jesus Christ. And we want his name to be lifted up in every way. And since so many um, leaders come through Princeton University and have for many years, we want them to know and love Jesus Christ and to use their positions of influence for good around the world. So many of us are familiar with stories in the Bible like Daniel, who had a position of extraordinary leadership and how he used that for Christian good, for the purposes of God. We know the stories of Esther and Mordecai, who also used their positions for the purposes of God. And Nehemiah, who used his position for the purposes of God. And we believe all those with the gifts of leadership, so many in the Princeton community have such gifts of leadership, should be using those for the purposes of God. So that's why Christian Union was formed, and Princeton was the first campus, and it was started at Harvard a few years ago, three and a half years ago, and then at Yale, and now Columbia and Dartmouth, and then we'll be starting at my alma mater, Cornell, um, this summer, and I'm very glad about that. So uh, with Princeton Faith in Action, it's a student organization with um, about 350, well, I, let me combine with legacy, both student organizations, uh, Prince of Faith in Action is focused on the student body at large. Legacy is a contextualized ministry for uh, African American students and students of African descent. Although, of course, there are students from that background in Prince of Faith in Action as well. But the purpose of these organizations is to develop these students as Christian leaders. There are a number of programs, uh, including uh, intensive Bible courses led by our ministry fellows, one-on-one uh, -on -one mentoring that happens, a weekly lecture series that we do, conferences, all for the purposes of development, all for coaching in order to be a, a Christian leader. And we praise God that uh, Princeton Faith in Action is the largest student organization on the Princeton campus of any kind. Um, the involvement has been growing rapidly and steadily year after year. Our hope and goal is that many more students will have the opportunity to be involved in the future. So um, I'll, at the end of this program, I'll uh, mention and point out a few of our um, ministry staff and students. But, um, what we have this morning is a few alumni of Princeton who love Jesus Christ and are sharing with us how being a Christian is impacting their lives after graduation. We found this to be enormously encouraging for existing students, but also for other alumni as well. And we can hear these stories and to know what's going on as role models and inspiration for them as well. And uh, each of these three have uh, amazing stories that you'll be very eager to hear. So uh, let me say a um, uh, prayer as we get started, and then uh, I'll um, introduce Catherine first, and we'll go into it. But uh, well, first I want to mention, are you uh, handing out those cards yet? Does everyone should have cards? Are they already handed out? On these cards, uh, if you have a question you want to ask in the end, go ahead and write it down, and then I'll present it to the panel at the end. So uh, you have your cards there, and hopefully have a pen to do that. So let me say a prayer. Dear Jesus, we love you and praise you this morning. You are great, wonderful, awesome, uh, beautiful, extraordinary. You are the great and awesome God. We thank you for what you're doing in our midst. We thank you for all the students' lives. You're changing in dramatic and powerful ways in this campus. And we thank you for these three alumni who are here being witnesses for you uh, for many years and uh, having a great impact in their spheres of influence. So, Lord, uh, we ask for your blessing on us this morning at this time as we hear from these people. In Christ's name, amen. amen. Okay, so first of all, I want to introduce Catherine Ferris Anderson, class of 97. She served as general counsel of Lytle Development Company since November of 2003, and she currently works part-time while raising two preschool boys, one with special needs. At Princeton, Catherine majored in history, was a member of the women's varsity swimming and diving team, and was first team all IV and all Eastern divisions. It's a long time ago, huh? Yeah. <laughs> After law school, she was an associate in environment and land.
Land and Resources Group at Latham and Watkins. Uh, Catherine is class of 97 vice president and is a 15 year alumni schools committee member. She and her husband Matt and sons Tyler and Sean call Newport Beach, California home where they are members of the Mariners Church. Thank you, Catherine. <laughs> Thank you for continuing to putting this event on. I just knew that this had existed when I was a student and when I was a, a young mom, um, although I guess I still am a young mom. <laughs> I'm going to be 15 years out. Um, the story you'll hear from me today is very different, obviously, than the story you'll hear from these two gentlemen because um, of the age and the life stage that I'm at. So um, it's just going to be a different, a different journey. And the, the one thing that I would say to kind of start off my talk that's the theme that sort of runs through it, is that you really need to trust God to direct you, to direct your career, your family, and your life path. Can you not hear me? Hardly hear me? Okay. Is that better? Yeah. Okay. Um, that I, I've learned that God has taught me I really need to lean on Him and trust in Him to direct my career path and my family path and the choices that I make, because the choices I want to make are not the choices that He wants for me. And, um, and that is a work of progress I'm still learning. <laughs> But we've made some progress. So um, you heard a little bit of my background from, from Matt. Um, and so I'll start off with sort of the more traditional route. Post Princeton, I went to, um, to law school, which was something that I had always wanted to do. Um, I intended to practice criminal prosecution. I had a very bad experience at a maximum security men's federal penitentiary that quickly changed my mind. And, um, and ended up taking a series of, of land use courses, which I, much to my total surprise, fell in love with. And that's the direction that my legal career went. So I was an environmental attorney uh, specializing in land use and, and development in Southern California. Um, and as you would expect, what comes with being a young associate at a major firm is a lot of very long hours um, and a lot of sacrifices for my career and friendships. And so um, Latham sort of, uh, it was a wonderful experience, but it ate up a lot of my time in that. And so the one thing that I was really careful and cautious to guard against was um, the areas of my faith that were really growing. And one of those was a Wednesday night small group that I was in in, my, in Manhattan Beach, which is where I lived. Um, and it, was, it probably took me 45 or 50 minutes to get home from work to go to that. And it was Wednesday nights at 8 o'clock, and everyone I worked for knew it. The partners that I worked for knew it, the associates I was on teams with knew it, my legal secretary knew it, and that was the one time that was secret. And what I found, and because at the beginning of doing this, I was a little nervous about how it would be received. But what I found was if I put my foot down and said, this is my sacred time and I'm leaving at seven on Wednesdays and there was nothing you can do to make me stay, they respected it and everyone knew it. Um, and I was encouraged by that and that helped kind of embolden me a little bit to not um, put my faith second or put other people's needs in front of that area of my life. And my legal secretary, she was a wonderful woman, but she was definitely not a Christian. Um, and she would copy my notes and read through them and ask me questions. And it was a really interesting way to witness my faith to people in, in a way that I didn't ever anticipate and that I didn't think would be as impactful. Um, but it really was. And I still run into people occasionally from um, Latham, and I haven't worked there now in a decade, who talk about it or ask me questions about it. What are you doing to church or what are you doing? So, um, so that, that was really an interesting way to, to start to um, integrate my faith into my work environment. Uh, but soon thereafter, I was in Latham for um, three years. Uh, and soon thereafter, our life kind of took an took a unexpected shift and I went to work for my family. Um, I took a personal leave from Latham to work for my family because of some medical problems within my family. Um, and that was a challenging change, and it wasn't one I saw coming. Um, but now I see God's hand in it because my family's in real estate development, and my land use background as an attorney was exactly what they needed. Um, and so I went to work for them. And I, after the six months, at this point, I was dating my now husband, and I was set to go back to Latham. And he said, "If you want to go back, I will support you. But if you really want to go back, we need to ask why. <laughs> and you need to analyze, you know, what is motivating you and what your choices are." And so I stayed and worked for my family and really enjoyed it and worked the same kind of work that I had done. But I didn't really know where it was gonna lead me and I had a lot of um, anxiety about, you know, when you work for your family, it's a different experience and there's a new nuance that comes with that. Um, so I had to just trust God that he had put me there for a reason. Um, and indeed he had, and a few years later after we were married, we had our first son. 
and he is four now, and he is a wonderful kid. Um, but being a mother and balancing a career was a whole different level of challenge than I had anticipated. I knew it would be hard, but it was really hard. <laughs> and um, so I came back to work, and I intended to come back part-time, which is what I did. And so for the first year and a half of his life, I worked three days a week. Um, and it was a really, a really good balance. It was a great transition for me to still be in the working world, but really be with my son. And then um, our second son was born. And that was a whole nother level of challenge. Um, and at the time when, my, when our second son was born, our first was diagnosed with high functioning autism. And so I, um, I really had to step back from work. And at that point, I had a lot of career opportunities that were opening to me. I was starting to think about other things that I could do. I was on the national board um, for, the, uh, for NAOP, which is the biggest office in industrial real estate uh, organization in the country. And so I was really excited about the direction things were going, and God just had to say, this is not the plan I have for you, and you need to trust that this is not the plan, and walk away from it willingly and focus on what you need to focus on. And that was hard. Um, it was very, very hard. However, it ended up being probably the biggest blessing that he has given me, because I am the most content that I've ever been. And I feel that I have more influence on people and their faith, and I'm a better example and role model than I was in the working world. Um, oddly, by coming closer into my family, I feel like my sphere of influence has actually increased because I'm now exposed um, through, the, uh, I, I, I do a lot of other things. I do ministry work at our church um, with young families, and I work with different um, nonprofit organizations, but my kids are my number one focus. And I really thought that would be a limiting experience. And, and at the beginning, it's a little, I mean, when you're home just changing diapers, it's pretty limiting. But soon, that changes. And so now I feel really confidently that God has put that in that roadblock in my life at the time I thought was as really an opportunity. Um, so one of the, one of the um, most interesting things I've had is there's a, there's a ministry that exists called MOPS, and it's the Mothers of Preschoolers. And it's not a type of organization I ever thought I would be working with or involved with when I graduated from this ever. <laughs> but I love it, and I work with all the, the small group discussion leaders, so I basically help facilitate all the small groups that are within that. And my job is to spiritually mentor these women so that they can spiritually mentor the other women that are with them. And that has been more rewarding than I ever thought possible. And I have found that although, you know, you read statistically, the majority of people who become Christians do so by the age of 18, perhaps in college, and then there's a significant shift. And I have found that young um, young women with young families are a very right group because they have these young children and they want to instill spiritual truth in them and they want to give them guidance and moral guidance and many of them did not get it from their own parents and they regret it and they miss it. So I have so many friends who I very hesitantly invited to come to an for the first time who came and I thought was my friendship. <laughs> but they came and now they're in leadership and many of them have become Christians and their children are going to church and their husbands are starting to come and it's been a really interesting uh, and that's what I mean like I feel like my sphere of influence has changed it's very different than I thought it would be but it's, it's more real and large in other ways than I ever imagined that it could be um, so I think that, that has been extremely rewarding and, and I think also learning that my spiritual gifts are faith and administration and teaching has been very helpful too because I can use all those things in raising my children and working in ministry areas, local or more local ministry areas at the moment, but we'll see where that ends up heading. But evangelism is not my gift. And I kind of felt like I needed to be a little more assertive about inviting people to things or sharing my faith with people. Or, and, and I don't do that well. I don't feel comfortable doing it. And it feels forced and it feels uncomfortable to the people I ever talk to about it. So I, I no longer have a sense of responsibility that that is the direction that's pushed ahead. I now feel very confidently that I can live my life the way that God has opened doors and walked through them and pay attention to his voice without the, the sense of the burden that I have a job that I have to do for him. I'm doing the job just by living my life and having people see me. So I think for the young alums that are here and the young women that are here who are just charting their path post Princeton, you need to have faith and trust in God. You need to rest on Jeremiah. 2911, for I know the plans I have for you. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you hope in the future. Because he does and he will, and it may look very different than what you expect it to look like, and it may look very different than all of your friends. It was 
going to see last night with my eight friends that I'm the closest to from Princeton. And I am the only one who is, well, I still work. I, I do work part time, but I am the only one that is really truly home with my kids most of the time. And it was hard, it's sometimes hard for me to get my hands around that. that this is not what I expected. But it is the best thing for me. It's the best thing for my family. And I think it is the best thing for the influence that God has placed in front of me. So I just encourage you to, um, to trust God that your life may look different than you expect and to be confident in the choices you make because there is a reason He is putting those things in your path. And He will bless you for it and you will bless others. Ken joined the Toro Company in 1970. In early 2006, he retired as chairman and CEO of the Toro Company and founded Leading by Serving, an organization in Orono, Minnesota. The company's mission is to advance the principles of servant leadership in business organizations. At Princeton, Ken majored in mathematics and electrical engineering. He was a varsity track letterman for three years. Ken earned a master's degree from MIT Sloan School of Management and an MBA from the University of Chicago. He's a frequent speaker at national conferences on the subject of servant leadership, building a values-based corporate culture, and how good cultures breed good ethics. Ken is a passionate supporter of the Princeton Faith and Work Initiative led by David Miller. David's here. He is a frequent speaker at the Faith and Work programs. So uh, thank you, Ken, so much for being here. Thank you very much, uh, Matt. Um, let me tell you, one of the most impactful events in my personal faith journey occurred in the early 80s. Uh, when I took a reading through the Bible course uh, for my church, and the teacher started the first session by asking the group, and you can think about this yourself, uh, what is the purpose of life? And uh, I was pretty young then, so I didn't have a clue that anybody else had a and, 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 well, let me ask you this question. How many of you remember your grandfather? Well, we like that. Right? Keep your hand up if you remember your great grandfather. Keep your hand up if you remember your great great grandfather. By that time, all the kids were He said, Oh, you don't remember your great grandfather. You know, it's this middle name was, the color of his eyes, what can you? Um, what this color of eyes, and, you know, so no one knew anything about their great great grandfather. So no, let's turn around. Suppose I was asking you uh, if you would, um, if you think your grandchildren would remember you, of course we all would, and you all uh, would say that. But when it got down to the great great grandfather, uh, we realized that none of the people in my family are going to remember me for generations from now. In fact, nobody on the face of the earth is going to uh, remember, remember me uh, for, for generations from now. And that was a pretty sobering thought, uh, that even our family would be. So he concluded that the purpose of life was to serve God by serving others. And um, uh, what will be remembered from your life will be the ripple effects that you create. They will go on forever in uh, various ways. And what you will be remembered is not uh, from your ripple effects, not who you are or what you became, but what you do in, in life, uh, what you do in your life. So this was the driving force in my early editorial uh, uh, career that moved me to a certain leadership model uh, values break based on the New Testament. And it's a concept of turning the organization upside down. I, as a CEO, work for management. Management work for the employees, and the employees work for customers. So the customers are the boss, and everybody underneath are serving their constituents uh, above them in the box. So I'd like to share with you how I applied my faith and my total uh, career by giving you an example of what a culture of faith-based values changed the way employees thought about their jobs and their role and the decisions they, they made. Uh, when I became uh, CEO of Toro, I wanted to change Toro from the traditional Wall Street uh, model, earnings per share every quarter, 
do what the analysts want you to do if you don't give yourself a uh, in the market. Um, and very short sure oriented. Uh, and um, so I wanted to change that to one that um, really focused on the employees and the customers and not so much on the shareholders. In fact, we said the most important constituent for us are employees. And then next, the next most important stakeholder is the customer. And the shareholders, by the way, are a distant third. Um, so certain leadership principles, such as we are brothers or keeper, we are with others, we uh, are humble heart, it's better to give to receive. So these were some of the uh, uh, preemptive uh, values that uh, uh, you directed the way we behave and the way we led. The principle of what we are brothers and sisters keepers meant to care for both employees and customers. Now, regardless of how they felt about you, and here, here's the example. As you might surmise, uh, Toro has a lot of product liability cases. Lawnmowers and snowblowers can cause injury, and um, if they're not operated properly, <laughs> here's the point of the cause. Toro would typically get sued by the family. So we get our attorneys involved, no matter who won the suit, we always lost the customer because they came with a lot of bad publicity. So two of our paralegals, uh, Helen and Carol, uh, in our product liability group, uh, they thought this was really nuts. How do you love the customer when the customer is suing you? Um, and the total stock looking at this problem is that, the, because we said this is a litigant problem, because they're going to sue us. They called their attorney, and our attorneys called our attorney. Uh, so, um, to Helen and Carol, uh, this wasn't a little bit problem. This is a customer satisfaction problem. These customers were very dissatisfied. They played, they got their finger cut off, or their son uh, got injured uh, cutting the lawn, or whatever. So, you know, when, whenever somebody had a problem with their mower or so forth, they called, said, you can't get it started. We help them. We help customers solve their, their problem. Um, for, for example, um, uh, some, a problem with the engine. That, uh, call the dealer for them, help them uh, get that, send them apart or whatever. Well, Carol and Helen said, well, since we are our brothers and sisters keepers, we should care for these customers who are going to sue us, um, especially since some of their, someone in their family may, may be hurt. So they proposed to management that one or the other ought to uh, call up the, the family uh, and say, we will come visit you. They get on a plane with, it, with an engineer and visit each of these uh, families and try to work out uh, an agreement with the family. With, their, with the family's attorney present, we wouldn't meet unless the attorney was there. So management said, okay, let's try it. And um, we started the process in 1991. It's called Alternative Dispute Resolution. We didn't really know what to expect. In my first 20 years at Toro, from 1970 to 1990. The MO was call our lawyers because uh, most of the cases are going to go to court. And this was, of course, very expensive. It was playing on all the resources. Insurance premiums started to skyrocket. And we always lost the customer. Um, so Kellen, Carol and Helen, with the engineer, visited each family with their attorney to review what happened. But their mission was to say, first and foremost, we're really sorry this happened. You're a customer of ours and you feel badly that uh, our mower, our or whatever the term, uh, participated in this problem that you had, the dad or the son or whoever. Uh, so we care about you, uh, and let's see what we can work out that would be fair. So at Carol or Helen would usually write out a check and deliver them to the home before they left. Since 1991, now we have followed the alternative dispute resolution process, and in that time, two thirds of all the cases were settled right there in the home. Um, they were all settled amicably. Almost all the others, except for maybe a, a one tenth of a percent, were settled uh, by mediation, which was still a friendly process. Of the 1,500 claims, 
from 1991 to the time I retired in 2006, 1,500 times, only one went to court. Only one. Um, product liability costs dropped on uh, the average for, the, for each year, dropped 75%. There was no more debt publicity. And here's the best part. These families were customers for life. They would go up and down their acres and say, you never, you never guess what happened. Somebody from Toro came out and said they were sorry. And they wanted to know what they could do to help. Um, so the empowerment of these two employees in a caring way, guided by the principle that we are our brothers and sisters keeper, they found a win-win solution for all. Over time, our servant leadership culture energized employees to take more initiative, uh, to build trust in their, in their teams, focus on satisfying customers. Everybody in the organization has customers. Some of them work for the same company. Not everyone has a homeowner uh, customer who wants to buy a home. Uh, and to be accountable. Um, it's a culture that still exists today, long after uh, retirement. Thank you.
uh, I had to decide what the final authority of the truth was going to be. At Princeton, and I assume this is true of so many of us that graduated from a school such as Princeton, we've got enormous confidence in our minds and our own intellect. Uh, and it became clear to me that the final source of authority, the final court of appeals, if we are lawyers, has to be the Bible. And, uh, and that was difficult for me. But I just, as a matter of will, determined that that would be true, that, that my faith would begin with believing in the Bible. That was an act of will, I hope of an act of will that was um, fortified by God's grace. Then the second question with respect to faith, which I had not understood before, is where's my trust going to be? Who am I going to trust? It? Again, graduating from Princeton, uh, we have a lot to trust in ourselves. Uh, living in the United States as wealthy as we are, it's easy to trust uh, in wealth. Uh, but it was clear to me from reading the Bible that my trust had to be in Jesus. Uh, in Jesus Christ, that he had to be the Lord uh, of all that I was doing. I was particularly taken by the verse in Colossians chapter 3. Uh, whatever you do, work at it with all of your heart is working for the Lord and not for men. It is Jesus Christ you're serving. Uh, and so I had, and this was not easy by the way, I mean it's taken years and years for me to live more fully in this. I had to trust Jesus Christ for results. And he was going to be the source of whatever results, successful or not, I was to have through the trust that I had uh, in him. And all of this could only be accomplished by the German with a much more complete prayer life than I ever had before. So I began each day at least 15 to 20 minutes of prayer, 15 to 20 minutes of reading the Bible. Of course, I had to understand the Bible it was going to be the source of authority. And it has been so much fun over the last 30 years um, to seek to understand exactly how the Bible relates to the world's work and how we incorporate the two as Ken has so successfully uh, um, in his career. And then finally, in terms of the faith that we bring to our work, um, I had to understand and, 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 and live into Jesus Christ being the source of the life of my soul. If we think of the soul as our faculties of intellect and will and affections or emotions, um, those, insofar as they were mine, had to be subordinated to Jesus Christ living in my heart. So I thought as he thought. Uh, and I will to do those things that he had purposed for my life. Uh, and that my affections and my desires were his and not mine. And so it is those three dimensions of life, what is the final four of appeals in terms of truth, uh, who am I going to trust, and where is the source of my life and action going to be as Jesus Christ abiding in me in such a way that it's he that is doing these things rather than I, is something that uh, I've tried to live into more fully of in my life. I love doing it about the way. Um, I guess if we go to Princeton, we're <clears throat> a little more intellectual than perhaps others. By the way, as I say, that is often an obstacle uh, rather than a benefit uh, of an education. So I try to think these things out. I've written a couple of books. Uh, I wrote the books more for my own benefit than for anybody else. The books were really good sleeping mats, and I found <laughs> for most. And um, um, so, in, that is the sort of faith that uh, I have sought to have more fully by God's grace uh, in the workplace and really in all that I do. I think the question that we're supposed to respond to this morning is what are we doing today? I haven't talked about anything that I'm doing today. I'm an old man and uh, there's not, not a lot for me to do. Um, uh, I am chairman of a wonderful inner city private school in Birmingham. I, I don't think there's any doubt that except for one or two private schools for rich kids, it provides 300 African Americans with the best 
elementary education, which is available uh, uh, in the state of Alabama, certainly uh, in Birmingham. That's a great source of joy uh, to me. Uh, I have been fortunate enough to be introduced to uh, two ministries in Africa, Rwanda, one in Uganda. The American dollar is so, so far in Africa compared to the United States. We can build a church in Rwanda, literally a church, that will see 400 people for $27,000. A school in Uganda that will uh, give an education to 800 kids for very little money. So I've loved doing that work. I'm about to go over there in a couple of weeks to, to finish that. Um, and I work here with Christian Union, uh, and that is the source. What, what Christian Union is doing, I wish it had been doing when I was here, because my understanding of what is true faith could have begun while I was an undergraduate at Princeton, Lord willing. I mean, it's only through His grace that we've grown into this appreciation. Uh, we can't do it on our own. We've got to do it uh, through through his love and his grace. But we didn't have a, a, a Christian union. We didn't have a Princeton faith in action then. And I'm so glad that we do now. And I wish those of you that are not acquainted with this ministry will learn more about it because of what is being done on the Princeton campus and throughout the Bible days. So I consider something that is best thought of as a miracle. And, and just so far what it was being done in terms of faith and action um, uh, that would have been I was an undergraduate. But, uh, even though Princeton was more probably uh, in terms of its at least outward profession, but a Christian university, more of a Christian university uh, then. Uh, I want to, want to leave you with three or four verses that have been very instrumental to me as I sought to live my faith in the workplace uh, as Ken so successfully does, and Catherine so successfully does in her life. And the first one uh, uh, is, uh, and I try to pray these every day, is in 2 Corinthians 9, verse 8, that is, may all grace abound to us so that in all things, at all times, having all that we need, we will abound in every good work. If we're going to do good things day by day, it's going to be by God's grace. And then there's a verse in uh, 1 Peter in, in chapter 4, and that is, use whatever gifts you receive to serve others. Again, that faith to admin, faithfully administrate, administering God's grace in his various forms. Then, if anyone speaks as you speak, is using the very words of God. I prayed that before I spoke this morning. I mean, like about 10 times up here. <laughs> uh, and if anyone serves, he should do with do so with the strength God provides, so that in all things God be praised. Then the last paragraph of Hebrews has this language in it. Equip us with everything good to do with your will and work in us what is pleasing to you. And then especially for someone age 71, um, and that is, may we be counted, this is in uh, second testament, may we be counted worthy of your calling. And dear God, by your grace, Build every good purpose of ours and every act uh, 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 from our faith to the glory of Jesus. So I try to pray these verses every morning uh, that the faith that God has given me in His grace will endure to His glory. Uh, praise God. Thank you so much to each of you. Um, let's uh, have the um, uh, cards collected and come forward. Thank you, Liz, for getting these. While we're collecting those, let's thank the speakers again. Thanks, guys. Three uh, different stories, but three moving and inspiring stories. So um, when, uh, okay, great. When, um, when asking these uh, folks to share in the panel, um, I think each one was concerned that their story was different, maybe not the same everyone else would hear, but that's the whole idea. You get some three different stories, which is great for us to be inspired by. So 
Um, so we've got a few uh, minutes for questions. So, um, okay, so um, to Mr. Neighbors, the question is, how was sitting on the Alabama Supreme Court a challenge to you? Uh, well, interestingly enough, uh, uh, in a peripheral way, uh, uh, issues relating to religion got me on the Supreme Court. Uh, Judge Chief Roy Moore uh, had put a monument uh, of the Ten Commandments in the front of the Alabama Supreme Court building a report that this was an unlawful establishment of religion and ordered it removed, and he did not remove it. And uh, ordered the judiciary in Alabama removed him from office because he had not respected a law or order of another judge. Uh, I was then working for the governor, and the governor said, Neighbor, get over the Supreme Court. <laughs> and, uh, 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 he appointed me Chief Justice. Um, I, I'll tell you a little bit story. I know this is an answer to the question. <laughs> When I accepted that appointment, um, uh, I recited Micah 6-8, what does the Lord require of us? Um, but uh, love, mercy, do justice, and walk humbly with our God. And I walked into the door of the Supreme Court building, and everybody started calling me chief. And I said, yeah, I'm going to walk humbly with God if everybody calls me chief. <laughs> <laughs> but um, uh, the work on the Supreme Court, I mean, you, you, you do try to do justice, that is challenging. Uh, more interesting to me, really, in the uh, short time I was on the Supreme Court, was an enormous administrative challenge. Chief Justice, the Alabama Supreme Court is in charge of the whole court system, and it was in disarray as a result of the criminal law relating to uh, Justice Moore's uh, regime, and we had to straighten that out. And I loved trying to do that in accordance with Christian principles and to inspire our people to be servants um, throughout the court system. All right, thank you. Okay, this question for each of you. What was your toughest career decision and how God worked through it? You, you shared a lot with yours. Maybe you can elaborate on it, but then we'd love to hear from others too. Uh, my, my toughest career decision, I'll be brief because um, it, it, I talked about it a little bit, was transitioning out of full-time workforce into full-time motherhood um, with part-time work. That was difficult, and it was much harder than I expected. Um, and, and I had to, um, I, a lot of your identity is wrapped up in your career choices and your education and your background, and I had to let go of who I thought I was and embrace who God thought I was and let that, let that go. And I'm like, you can get out of the way and trust me on the right path. That was hard. I think the toughest uh, time for me, uh, well, I know the toughest time for me at Torah was when they appointed me a CEO in uh, 1981. Uh, we were about to go bankrupt. The company was uh, losing money, the stock was plummeting. Uh, we had way too much overhead. Uh, and we, in order to survive, we had to terminate 60% around our workforce. We had to close most of our plants, all of our offices except one, and it was just awful to look at uh, friends that uh, I had known for the first 10 years of my journal life and say, you know, we decided that the position that you're in is not, we don't need that to survive, so you have to go. We're going to help you and the other um, 3,000 employees uh, by uh, helping you get find another job. Fortunately, it was only a recession for Toro. All the other corporate uh, corporations were doing very well in, in that period of time. So they all got jobs, and a lot of them are back in Toro. But it was just gut-wrenching mm -hmm. to, and it was the only way. The auditors were about to give us a qualified opinion the banks were leaving us, and uh, it looked like we were going to go down. So but we didn't, and uh, the rest is history, as I said. Mm -hmm. And if you don't mind me uh, asking, how did God help you get through that? Uh, anything in particular stood out? Well, well it, it, it really was a, a demand of a very strong prayer life. Yeah. Um, a lot of um, uh, 
a fellow Christians in the organization, and I was fairly, uh, fairly public, uh, probably more than I could be today, of uh, my faith. I wore a WWJD uh, wristband uh, of different colors. One time I was green, and somebody said, why are you wearing that? Worldwide John Deere. <laughs> <laughs> so I stopped wearing green. <laughs> but, but I had a Bible on, on my desk and I had a sign above my uh, telephone that said, God meant for you to be here now. Because I thought, God, why did you do this to me? Mm -hmm. uh, I'm, not, I'm not capable mm -hmm. of engineering a, a turnaround. Only with your grace and your presence can do this. So, prayer life uh, and uh, a lot of conversation with God. Uh, so that's what got me through. Mm, thanks. Brayden? Um, I'm going to answer the question truthfully, and you probably going to say maybe you ought to be a doctor better than this. But uh, I practiced law for 12 years, and everything was going well in my law practice. And I was offered the opportunity to go to effective life uh, in a public and traded company and begin a new career there, more in management than in law. And I just hated to give up uh, the practice of law. I loved it. I was challenged by it. Uh, everything was going to go. Uh, but the opportunity was offered me it was also attractive. So I prayed and prayed and prayed for God's guidance. Meanwhile, my wife was saying, please don't change anything. Life is too good. Don't, don't, don't take the offer. And uh, I told the city of Texas, I was turn it down. He did not take that answer. And the next day, he just said, when you come in with this question, <laughs> uh, uh, pray. And I made a list, and, and I just could not get any confirmation from God. This is what to do. Everything was in equal forms. So, I trust that God speaks more clearly to some of you in the audience than to us. I finally, I finally just said, God, I'm going to go with the detective. I sleep well tonight. <laughs> and I slept well that night. I'm with the detective. <laughs> and it was obviously, and I, I am sure that it was in God's plan in my life to go with the detective. So maybe I'll just I'll choose to be right here. Amen. Hey, the new Gideon's fleece. That's great. <laughs> Amen. Thank you. Uh, okay, I wish we had time for all the questions, but uh, we don't. But um, uh, let me uh, ask this one. Uh, how do you make uh, daily make Jesus your source of delight for your soul amidst everything that comes at you and what you're doing all day? What do you do to do that? Start with Catherine again, if you don't mind. That's, that's, you're quick on your no, feet. that's an interesting question. Um, I don't know that there's anything concrete that I do. I mean, I... Um, I take, I, I mean, I think because I know that I'm following God's path, I have a great contentment in my life. And sometimes days are rough and things don't go well. I'm exhausted. Um, but I, I'm just happy. I'm in a place of peace and contentment. And um, I delight in my kids. They're so challenging, but they're so wonderful and fun. Um, I delight in my husband and our relationship. I delight in my friends and my church community. I just feel... Um, I just feel God's hand in my life, and I know that I'm walking in the right path, and that gives me joy. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, I, I don't know how else to describe it. I, I, um, I have a great prayer life, an active prayer life. I could have a better one. I think everyone here could probably say that. I wish it was a little better, but I just take great joy and delight in knowing um, that when I trust in Him and lean on Him, He, he makes the way straight. Mm -hmm. Amen. Thank you. Well, one of the things that... Um, has always been uh, very <clears throat> delighting or delightful for me when I come to work at Toro. We have, uh, we have uh, now 5,000 employees. We've got some of those people back. And, uh, uh, but in the office, this is the um, headquarters uh, in Bloomington, Minnesota, uh, we, 60 of those employees are members of what we call prayer warriors. Uh, and and they uh, every other Wednesday at noon they they um, meet in one of the conference rooms and they they are praying for people employees employee families are sick or people need 
So I, I know them all. Um, even now, I'm on, I, that's the one email, you know, that I'm retired from that. So one email I kept from, from Toro is the prayer warriors or the prayer request. Uh, so I, I, I know them all very well. And so walking around the halls uh, at Toro, you know, almost every day I'd see at least one of them. And Velma or Bill would have this big smile, and they knew uh, that I knew that they were prayer warriors, and they felt so. I was just really happy. It just was a joy to to know. Gosh, we've got 60 people in in this building that they are praying uh, for the leadership. That means praying for me, praying for the employees, and it's just a really neat thing to see almost every day. And it's very delightful. Right, thank you. Uh, I think we have the delight uh, of the Lord in our hearts when He, through us, is accomplishing His will through us. So, uh, the prayer I love to pray is the one from Colossians. We have knowledge of your will for all spiritual wisdom and understanding. We can live a life worthy. We please you in every way. So, if we know what Jesus Christ will for us is, and we walk in it in His strength, His delight will be in our heart. Mm -hmm. Amen. Okay, thanks. Uh, last question here. We'll wrap all of this up. Um, the question is many times in the workplace, kindness and graciousness is interpreted as weakness. Uh, this is particularly true for women, but I think it's true for all of us. Um, how have you managed to show God's love without being taken advantage of? Can you? Amazing example of that, but uh, I think it'd be great to hear um, each of you how you respond to that. Well, it's it's not, not fair to make you. Yeah, you've been so good on your feet. I'll go first. I'm going to go first. Yeah. 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 Catherine, and show me up. That's very interesting, and I, I love to talk about humility because everyone, I mean, it's easy to associate humility with being meek and weak. Ineffective. And um, I, was, I was given this talk at the University of Alabama about three weeks ago, and I used the example of Barrett Jones, who is a wonderful Christian uh, student at the University of Alabama. He's also a good time all American, offensive line. He weighs about 315 pounds, and uh, he's 6'5 and he gets tough as nails. Um, but he is a humble man, uh, and we can be humble and serve the Lord. Uh, but still very effective in the workplace. By the way, the reason I tell the story about Barry Jones is I didn't know it, but he was in the audience. And everybody started giggling back right wherever he was sitting. <laughs> but um, the ethic of love can be worked out in effective decisions in the workplace. And you can be humble as a leader in the workplace and a servant as Ken is in the workplace and still uh, have very, very successful results, as Ken has done all of his life. Um, so there is not a conflict um, between love and leadership, or between humility and leadership. There's the two of in harmony with each other. Well, at uh, Toro, we have a moniker, GBO. Uh, it, it's a headliner for the way we behave with others, and it stands for genuinely valuing others. And one of, one of the uh, issues, particularly during our re return and getting out of this uh, near bankruptcy period, is uh, a recognition, finding, catching people to do some, something right. Uh, taking out Ken Blanchard. Ken Blanchard had, had written the one manager who came to Toro uh, to help us, he and Steve Covey, on, on what our culture should be. And he said, uh, you've got to catch people doing things right. And we get into um, staff meetings, and everyone would say, well, this is what's going wrong. We've got this big problem that we've got to solve. They'd be telling me their, their woes, and I'd be so depressed. Hey, <laughs> <laughs> everything's going wrong here. And uh, I wish I knew uh, something that was going well. So I, I so Blanchard suggested, why don't you get your staff meeting uh, together and say, now, I know you all are eager to talk, 
and tell me uh, what's going on. Uh, but I don't want to, you, 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 if you're going to talk, you have to first tell me something you liked that's going on in your group. Silence. <laughs> no one said anything. I said, now, did you, did you understand? I, I, I want to first hear from you about something really positive. Silence. Okay, well, meeting is over. I got up and walked back to my office. And everyone else was kind of dumped down. <laughs> next week, we have staff meeting, just like before. Did the same thing. Same thing happened. I said, all right, thanks. I'm going back to my office. <laughs> so they finally got the message. So what, what happened is they had to go around looking for something positive. And they had, if they were vice president, and they had some marketing director, production director, working for them, they had to go say, hey, Melrose wants me to find something right. <laughs> uh, I need you to give me a story here. And that was infusing uh, the whole organization. What's, what's going on with well? and, and, uh, oh, good. and so what happened is the officers would have a collection of, here's some really good things. I mean, we still have bad things, but here's some good things. What are we going to do about it? Oh, let's recognize them. Send them a note. Send them some flowers. One, one time we had one of our um, data processing guys. Uh, he just got married and our system crashed on Friday. Uh, he spent the night, two nights, forgave his honeymoon and uh, he, uh, he was getting the system back up. And they, they, they uh, one of the guy and I in the racial system said, I want to tell you about this. Oh, that's good. Well, what should we do about that? We need to recognize it. I send his wife a bouquet of flowers. Uh, pay for their, uh, their honeymoon for two days. Give him some time off. Go by his office and our cubicle and say, hey, this was really a great thing. You did. Get a group of his or her peers together and say, let's have a little mini celebration. What you did was really good. So those kind of things started happening and it lifted the spirit of the organization to really see. My answer will be a, little, a different perspective because I, um, since 2003, have worked with my family and so kindness, and I, I work with other Christians, I work with other people who share my worldview. So to go back and really answer that, I look back to when I was a junior associate at my law firm, uh, which was not a Christian environment and not a warm and fuzzy place. Um, but that said, I don't think, for me at least, showing kindness and um, and expressing my faith was never seen as weakness, and I think. You can be very assertive and still be kind and not edgy. Um, and so for, for me to, to show that side of me, I didn't get walked over. I asked questions. I inserted myself in meetings. I took responsibility and took on projects and added clients because that's sort of how I was wired. But I didn't do that. Um, I think a lot of times with women in business in particular, there's a little chip on their shoulder. They're perceived um, to be a little power hungry, ruthless, um, and often not supportive of their peers or other women in the organization. And sometimes I found that, uh, particularly with, with some of the partners that were females that I worked for. But I don't think that has to be the case. And I think um, if you are true to yourself and you're assertive and you don't allow people to walk over you, you can, you can act with integrity and you can act with kindness. And you can, um, it's just in sort of the daily expression of your life. It's not participating in the gossip about who did what with you over the weekend. It's um, it's walking out of a conversation when someone's bad mouthing their 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 you know friend um, who's working on a, on a project with them or a case with them. It's it's just sort of nipping the the snipiness in the bud and um, and not doing it in a mean or cutting way, but just sort of not allowing it to be around you. People recognize that it takes it takes a few times, but after after you sort of set that as your pattern of behavior, people know that about you and they respect it. Uh, and they don't, they don't see it as weakness. They just sort of understand that's how you're wired and that's, that's what your principles are and that if someone wants to trial them in front of you, you're not going to stand up for it. Uh, and some of not standing up is just not being present for it and, and you know, leaving that sort of stand. So, yeah. But I, I did, I, I know people knew my faith and I know people respected it and I know that, um, and I still have very close friends from that time and, and it wasn't perceived. 
perceived, uh, the kindness was not perceived as weakness. Wow, well, thank you very much. This has been very encouraging, very inspiring. There is a brunch that Prince of Faith and Action and Legacy are hosting right after this at 10.30. It's over in uh, room B in the um, in Frisk. Let's see, um, make sure I get, uh, yes, uh, B level in the Frisk Campus Center. Or as one person called it, the after party. I like that name. So uh, come on over for brunch. There's a worship service tomorrow hosted by Nassau Christian Center right across um, the, uh, from Rockefeller College. And there will be testimonies from various alumni there, which would be encouraging for you to hear. And a couple other things I want to mention. For those of you who want to hear stories of other Princeton alumni who come to faith in Jesus Christ, uh, Christian Union published a book a couple years ago, uh, Under God's Power, and there's three copies out there. So please help yourself if you want a lot of amazing, encouraging stories. And also, if you want to learn more about what um, Christian Union is doing at Princeton and at other campuses, then sign up uh, in the back there. Uh, we send out a quarterly magazine, the I Believe Christian Observer, that describes a whole spiritual atmosphere at Princeton and other colleges here in the Northeast, as well as uh, a quarterly publication that describes what God's doing um, at Princeton and students' lives. So um, let me say a prayer, and I'm going to thank all of you again for coming out. Uh, dear Lord Jesus, we love you and praise you. Thank you for this time together. Thanks for these inspiring stories and the way you work in our lives. You're such a good God. Our Lord Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.